So again, we are gathered here today to celebrate the life and memory of our friend and brother in the Lord, David Neverton, who passed away on October 14th. The reason for having the service here today, three months after... Everybody's still waving. Three months after David's death is because this place, the historic Chapala Railway Station and Museum, was a very special place to David. He was leading efforts to install the Garden Railway, and David, as many of you I'm sure know, built all of the buildings and recreated the trains from sort of basic models in order to represent exactly what the trains would have historically been like when the Chapala Railway Station was in operation. Because that project and this museum was such a very important passion for David, Susan felt it was most appropriate that we have David's memorial here and that we do it near the time when that installation is expected to be finished. I'm sure that most of you looked at the buildings and the trains and some of the other the photos and whatnot as you came in today. Uh, this display is only temporary. This is just put there so that you'll have some idea of David's efforts in creating those buildings and trains, but it's expected that the final installation will hopefully be finished in two weeks. So you will need to come back to see what the actual installation of the Garden Railway will be like. In your service bulletins that you have, there's a brief biography of David, and it will tell you something about some of his passions, including his passion for trains, obviously, and for antique cars. As you may have read by now, David was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1936, and I think that probably has something to do with his passion for antique cars. And you might have noticed that one of the larger and more impressive buildings that David built for this garden railway is called the Beecher's Old Meatpacking Plant. And if you read the small type at the bottom, it says, purveyors and processors of better dead animals. <laughs> I'm sure that that was David's tongue-in-cheek homage to his lifetime career because he worked his whole professional life in the meatpacking industry. And in fact, he holds 18 different patents for processes related to meatpacking. Certainly, I don't think if you knew David, you know you didn't have to be around him very long before you realized that he was a man of many and far-ranging interests. It seemed like there is nothing that he was not fascinated by. He loved uh, trains and cars, boats and antiques, his beloved dogs, and especially his family. I honestly believe there wasn't anything that David Netherton, from what I knew of him, was not interested in or even fascinated by. Last fall, David started taking classes at our new Lakeside Theological Institute. Uh, during that first term of our courses, I spoke to David about what he wanted to gain from taking theological courses because we're offering graduate level uh, training in theology. And his answer told me quite a bit about who he was as a person. He said that he wanted to take all of the courses that we offered at the Theological Institute and that he wanted to receive our highest offered degree, which, was a ma which is a Master's of Biblical Studies in Ministry. Well, I asked him what he wanted to do with that degree, because it's really intended for people who are more directed toward ministry. And he smiled that sort of crooked smile of his, and he said that he never was one to do things halfway. If he was going to take a class at all, he was going to go all the way and get the highest degree we offered. And then he smiled even bigger, and he said... He especially liked the idea that someday, when he was gone, and as he said, his kids were having to go through and sort all the stuff that he had collected, that he wanted them to find a certificate that said he had a master's degree in theology, because he thought that would just be a kick. Well, Susan, I want to tell you that even though David was only able to complete the first course of the Lakeside Institute of Theology, in 18 months or so, when we offer our first degrees in the Masters of Biblical Studies and Ministry, I hope you'll be able to be there, because it is my intention to offer an honorary degree to one of our first and most enthusiastic students, David Clark Netherton. So please glad to be there. Okay? And now as we continue to celebrate David's life, I'd like for all of you to please stand and join together in singing the grand old hymn, How Great Thou Art, the uh, words are in your bulletins. Please stand together. You can't hear the music. You can't hear the music.
1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today thanking you for having brought David Netherton into our lives. We thank you especially for the gusto that he showed for so many interests and how he reflected such love of life. At the same time that we thank you for David, we also confess that we still have heavy hearts at the loss of our friend and brother. And in our grief, we acknowledge that it is not for David's sake that we are sad, for we know that through his faith and trust in you, David is now in your presence, past the point of any grief or pain, and rejoicing with all the company of heaven. Know our sadness, fathers, for those of us who knew and loved David and who must remain behind for a little while longer to continue on without his endless enthusiasm and encouragement. And so, Father, we ask you now to bless Susan and to bless all of David's friends and family and to help fill the emptiness that each will feel as they experience life without him. We pray that through your Holy Spirit you might comfort and encourage all who love David, both those who are gathered here and those who are not here, that through your strength we may be able in our hearts to begin to celebrate the victory that he has now found in you. 
And we pray, Father, that all of us can remain true to the same faith in you that David had and that we may live out the rest of our appointed time with his same assurance until that day that you choose to call each one of us to you and we can enjoy a blessed reunion with David and with all those who have trusted in you and have gone before us. And so now, Father, we come before you and we pray to you the prayer that your son Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our next scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. As most of you know, I'm the pastor of Lakeside Presbyterian Church, where David and Susan, um, David was a member, Susan is a member. Being pastor of a church in a community with so many retirees means that inevitably I end up doing a lot of memorial services. And in those services, I often say that there really is only one appropriate topic for a meditation at a funeral or memorial service for a Christian, and that topic is hope. As Norm just read from Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, we Christians are not supposed to be like other people. We have hope whereas others may have no hope when they are confronted with death and with the passing of a loved one. But saying that we talk of hope at a Christian memorial service leads us to the question, what is it that we are supposed to be hoping for? The Apostle Paul, again, said that there are three great virtues in the Christian life, and those virtues are love, faith, and hope. But what is it exactly we hope for? At a time like this, it's easy to say that we hope for heaven. But when we talk about heaven, we have to realize that most people have very little idea what heaven is supposed to be like. Heaven conjures up for most people images of wings and harps and sitting around on clouds for the rest of eternity. I mean, what after all are the saints supposed to be doing in heaven forever and ever? Just harps and wings and singing? Won't heaven be boring? I mean, after all, it sounds like one very long church service. <laughs> and who wants to go to church forever, right? I'm the pastor, and who wants to go to church forever? A survey was done of children to ask them their ideas about religious topics, and they asked these children to describe heaven. One seven-year-old boy named David said that heaven is kind of big, and they sit around playing harps. I don't know how to play a harp, but I suppose I should learn how to play that dumb thing pretty soon. <laughs> Another seven-year-old named Tommy probably spoke for a lot of adults when he said, I know what heaven is, but I don't want to go there. I want to go to North Carolina instead. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of adults probably secretly think the same thing. Based on their very weak idea of what heaven might be like, they would rather not go there if they had a choice. They would rather go somewhere else. Maybe not North Carolina, but Maui or Tahiti. <laughs> well, Scripture tells us that in heaven we will stand before God, singing and worshiping and serving the Lord. We will celebrate a great victory together. We will serve in God's temple and we will see him on his throne. And at one level, I'm quite confident that we will not get bored with that. But the Bible tells us that there's much more to heaven than all of that. 
In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah tells us of a vision that God gave him in which God announces his plans for a new heaven and a new earth, what we generally refer to as heaven. In that vision, God identifies this new creation as the new Jerusalem, and he says to Isaiah, See, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they even come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox, the, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy all on my holy mountain. Based upon this and other passages of Scripture, we have to say that heaven will not, in fact, be boring. In addition to worshiping and enjoying God, there will be houses to build and dwell in, there will be vineyards to plant and eat from, and we will enjoy the work of our hands forever. You see, in heaven, all of our gifts and talents will be used, including all the ones that we couldn't find time for here on earth. Here on earth, so many things hold us back. Circumstances keep us from doing what we know down deep inside that we really want to do and could do. The demands of daily life keep us from being all that we think we can be. Physical limitations sometimes hamper us. There are those among us who want to sing, but there is no one to hear us sing. Others want to paint, to cook, to write, to design, perhaps to design a garden railway. Think of your dreams and hopes and aspirations and ponder how few of those have been realized so far in your life. In heaven, you will have ample time to develop all of them. I had a pastor once who said that if you always wanted to play the saxophone and you're 85 years old, start taking lessons because you'll be playing the saxophone forever. In heaven, we will take all our gifts and talents and put them at the disposal of the Lord, and for all eternity we will find ourselves growing and learning and all the while celebrating the amazing grace of our sovereign God. That is what we hope for. That is the heaven in which each of us will worship and enjoy God and also enjoy each other, and in which we will be able to enjoy the work of our hands forever, as God said to Isaiah. Enjoying the work of our hands forever. How wonderful. You know, I think of all the people I have ever met, perhaps no one enjoyed the work of his hands more than David Netherton. David seemed to be interested in everything, as I've already said. He was always making something just for the pure enjoyment of it. And David Netherton was a Christian, which means that he believed that Jesus Christ was God's own son, who came to earth to save us from ourselves and our sin, and to make it possible, among other things, for us to spend eternity in fellowship with God and each other in heaven. And so if we see heaven as a place that will not only include worship, but also relationships and meaningful work and enjoyment of the work of our hands, understanding that about heaven and understanding that that is what awaits Christians after death makes death simply the start of a truly great adventure, the doorway to glory, the entrance to an unending journey beyond our wildest imaginations. And with that understanding, I honestly believe that heaven is just the kind of place that David Netherton will enjoy. It will likely be a long time before we again meet somebody like David. We will miss him. But if we allow ourselves to, we can continue to be inspired by his enthusiasm for life and his commitment to Jesus, to his wife Susan, to his family, and to his many, many creative interests. Perhaps most assuringly and inspiring of all, those of us who love the Lord know that we will see David again. He is in heaven waiting for us, and I am quite sure that when we do meet David again, he will have a great many new things, the work of his hands, to share with us. In fact, I'm quite sure he will have acquired a few new hobbies. In closing, let me share with you one last glorious vision of heaven that we receive from John the Apostle in the book of Revelation. This is the glory that we are to expect when our lives are over. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on their throne said, I am making everything new. Amen. We now come to a time of sharing memories of David, testimonies of what our lives and experiences of him have been. And to begin, I would like to ask Perry King from the Shriners Club to come up and speak to us. Perry? I first met David about five years ago. And as often happens, uh, we didn't meet each other, our wives did. And they got us together one day. And Susan invited us over for dinner, or lunch, I believe it was. And being the first time in their house, obviously I had to have a house tour, starting out in the kitchen. Now, if you've ever been to Susan's kitchen, to me the most impressive thing is a box of cabinets about that wide, about that high, containing some 3,000 recipes, Susan? 15,000? 15,000 recipes. I only opened two drawers and I was hungry. <laughs> the rest of the tour of the house took me into David's office where I saw six Packards up on the wall, photographs of the cars he'd collected. Beside his desk, a model of a frigate where the gun turns, turned around electronically. Then we went out onto the back patio and looking up on the wall, there's a picture of a 28-foot schooner. And I also saw going through the house an airplane with David standing beside it. I finally realized, after seeing all those objects, I had met the Renaissance man. <laughs> David was not a Shriner. His father was. And in Detroit, his father was very active in the Shrine and very active in the annual Shrine Circus fundraisers. However, although he wasn't a Shriner, every time we had a fundraising event, David was the first one to buy a ticket. He, he went to every event I think we ever had. David showed me his model railroads and uh, I was quite impressed. He says, I'm going to build it in the garden here by the house. Give me some ideas of what kind of base to put down. We discussed it, we discussed it. Unfortunately, uh, he became ill and went in the hospital and had three heart attacks in one night. The doctor gave him 12 hours to live. I visited David, I think the next day or two. He says, I'm not gonna die. 10 days later, he walked out of the hospital. Then he realized that perhaps he shouldn't build the railroad in his garden but he was looking for a nobler cause. And we came up with the idea of building it here in the old Chapala Railway Station Museum. David was enthusiastic. He started doing drawings, layouts. He must have done 15 or 20 different schemes before we finally settled on the one that you see under construction here. David loved to do the exhibitions we made as fundraisers using the trains. We set them up on the grass here several times. At one of those exhibitions, we had the train set up over by the green chairs there, and we had the four passenger cars and the green locomotive that you'll see out here. That was a replica of the original railroad that ran from Chapala to Guadalajara. A little old lady walked up with her grandson and looked at the train. She started excitedly saying something in Spanish. We happened to have a translator nearby, and this is what she said. I rode that train when I was a little girl. My parents took me to Guadalajara to have my tonsils removed. Well, when David and I heard that, we insisted on getting a photograph. So we got the little lady to stand up and 
with me on the other side of the train and took her photograph. David blew it up, signed it, and we took it to our home in St. Nicholas and gave it to her. That little 92-year-old lady is here today. I'd like to introduce Carmelita, sitting here on the front, and Maria, if you can help her to stand up. She is the only one that we know still living that rode the train. There may be others. As I said, when I first met David, I knew he was the Renaissance man, but I didn't know how caustic and honorary he could be. That didn't take very long to find out. David was, as Reverend uh, Ross Arnold said, very, very active with his hands, and he eventually formed what's called the Polo Club, and one of those members will speak in a moment. In addition to the trains and planes, he uh, wrote a book about model railroading. It's in its last chapter. We're just waiting to get this project finished. We get the final photographs. They'll be in the book, and Doug Langley will tell you a, bit, a little bit about the book later on. Thank you. Are there others who would like to come and share their memories of David? Okay, let me see if I can bring the mic down there for you. That is okay. I can talk loud enough, I think, <laughs> for everybody to hear. Thank you. I got to know David a few years ago. And I work on the KISS principle. The KISS principle is keep it simple, silly. <laughs> so, David was not a talker. He was a doer. And I believe he lived by the principles that Jesus taught. When his apostles asked Jesus, how should we live? Jesus said, Moses and the prophets gave you all these rules to live by. And I gave you only one. And it is the greatest. Love one another as I love you. And he'd say, meant you should not bother about their race, color, or creed, but show love for everyone, for all of God's creatures. And he loved us, he died for us on the cross. And he expected that we would live the same way. And David, as I said, was a doer, not a talker. And he did things that he knew people would love. And that's what he has done for us and everybody else who will get the opportunity to see what he had done and we would like to continue and try and complete his work for him. Amen. Thank you. Are there others who would like to share their memories of David? Please come up. We'd like you to come up here because we are taping this for family members and others who couldn't be here today. You know, you couldn't be a friend or know David without having 
some experience that he surely had through his life and could share uh, ad infinitum with you. Um, I was one of those guys and cars were one of the principal things that I grew up with. My father was a mechanic and uh, I built my own car from 15 to 17 years old. Um, David and I had discussed ad infinitum, the number of things that uh, he had possessed in the way of automobiles. Unbelievable. The other thing that is interesting about the things that we, the things that we did, um, he was a model builder, a superior. I was a model builder to occupy time when I was a younger kid. He carried it to a degree that you can see here and at the home uh, with unbelievable things that he accomplished. I just want to say I appreciated him. <coughs> And boy, do I miss him. I do have two notes that were sent from friends who couldn't be here today. Uh, the first I want to read to you is from Stan Parnett. He sends this message. As we cannot share the day with you on the 20th, we are sending a note to let you know our feelings about David. I deeply regret that I am unable to speak these words in person to Susan, especially to Susan, who became Dave's soulmate, the love of his life, and a truly remarkable person, and to his family and friends at the celebration of his life. I had the privilege of knowing Dave Netherton for many years. We met through our work, and that became the basis of a lasting friendship. If there were ever any truth to the words, women constantly tell us men about the necessity for male bonding, I can tell you for sure, Dave and I passed that test. We enjoyed decades of sharing knowledge and passion for our work. Luckily for me, this expanded into other areas of both of our lives. We developed a mutual trust and respect. We talked and we listened. We advised. We never judged. We laughed and yes, we loved. We got that male bonding thing down to perfection and for that, David Netherton, I am forever grateful, Stan Parnett. And a second message from a friend, Fred Kerr. Let me read to you. Dave Netherton loved life and he lived it well. He made life exciting for himself and all others around him. He always made you feel like a dear friend when you talked, whether it was often or seldom. He showed interest in what you were doing and made you feel special. Just hearing him talk about his train project brought you right on board. His love for his dogs, especially Ruby, always came through. He loved Mexico and made you want to move there. My friend Netherton was a special guy with a big heart, and I will miss him. Are there any other recollections that people wish to share of David? Well, we had another song, but we have a couple. OK. Um, I'm going to skip over the other song for two reasons, because we're having trouble uh, hearing the music and also because uh, we have a couple of distinguished guests who need for us to move forward. Um, so allow me just to do a closing prayer and benediction and then we are honored to have uh, Maria Elena and speak to us. And so receive this, the benediction. And to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever, in the grace and in the powerful name, powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Now, Father, we close by thanking you again for David, for his life and for his enthusiasm, for his faith in you and for his eternal reward. We pray again for an extra measure of your presence for each of us in this time of remembering. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. As I say, we do have two uh, local, the, the Maria Elena, who is the director of the facility here, and the Ministry of Cult Minister of Culture. 
Um, as soon as they're finished, we want to invite you to a time of refreshment. I think Susan herself has made uh, all of this food for us. You must enjoy it uh, with us. And then also the Shrine Club will be offering beverages for sale. So we do ask you to continue to stick around for a while and participate in uh, a time of fellowship and further remembering of David. And now let me ask Maria Elena if she would care to come. Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos al Centro Cultural González Gallo, antigua estación del ferrocarril en Chapala. Esta tarde estamos recordando al señor David. Yo quiero platicar algo sobre él porque es una persona muy peculiar para nosotros. Él llegó un día con un proyecto. Él era un admirador de, esta, de este edificio, de esta estación del ferrocarril. Y bueno, su proyecto fue este que se está apenas en proceso, es la primera parte. Y tenemos, pues la verdad yo estoy agradecida con él porque es un ejemplo en cierta forma de la tenacidad. Creo que de tres, ¿cuántos años, Perry? ¿Que empezó el proyecto? Cinco, cinco años, hace cinco años él llegó y nos dijo su proyecto, lo empezamos a trabajar y bueno, pues en esta ocasión creo que hay una parte que se está volviendo realidad y bueno, yo les quiero presentar a algunas personalidades que vienen a acompañarnos en este evento tan importante y bueno, pues está con nosotros el secretario de Cultura, el arquitecto Alejandro Cravioto Lebrija, este, del gobierno del estado de Jalisco. María Elena is introducing the Secretario Cravioto that he came from Secretaría de Cultura from the state of Jalisco. And she's very thank uh, María Elena is very thankful for the participation of David in the Centro Cultural from the train station. Five years ago that he started with the project and they've been working together. And she's very glad for all, all the time he invests and the results that we're having today. También tengo el gusto de tener aquí con nosotros a la maestra Lucy Mendoza, que ella es nuestra regidora de cultura del municipio de, Guad de Chapala. Maestra Lucy. We also have maestra Lucy, she is the regidora from here from the municipio from Chapala and we're happy to have her here too. Y bueno, les quiero platicar un poquito cuál es el objetivo de este proyecto y por qué está aquí con nosotros. Resulta que la propuesta que nosotros entendemos del señor David es que muchos de nuestros jóvenes y niños no conocen el ferrocarril, nomás saben que hay una estación de ferrocarril, pero no conocieron. Quizás todos nosotros nos pudimos subir en alguna ocasión en un ferrocarril, hemos podido ver a una máquina llegar viajar en el ferrocarril, pero actualmente el ferrocarril no es algo muy usual. We're happy from the fact that David project's project was to get know all the young people here in Chapala for they can know about the train because many well the young people don't know about the train like we did in the past. We had the chance to be in a train, we had the chance to saw a train running and arriving, and it was his feeling for all the children and youngs from here that they can learn about the train and have that feeling too. Y creo que esta es la oportunidad de que nuestros niños y jóvenes conozcan nuestra historia, conozcan todo ese acervo cultural que tenemos con los ferrocarriles, con la época porfiriana, que fue una época muy importante, de mucho crecimiento a nivel nacional, y que pues no es lo mismo leerlo en la historia, leerlo en los libros, perdón, a ver un trenecito, y se, a lo mejor no van a sentir lo mismo que se sintió cuando llegó la primera máquina aquí, pero sí van a sentir lo que es un trenecito, un tren, creo que te da una idea, y creo que eso es una pues algo muy positivo, muy pedagógico para los niños y jóvenes. 
y creo que nuestra función es precisamente recuperar toda nuestra historia, que las, nuestra comunidad lo conozca. Y bueno, pues yo quiero agradecer en nombre del Centro Cultural González Gallo, quiero agradecer esta participación de la comunidad extranjera en este proyecto tan importante para la comunidad de Chapala. Muchas gracias. Y bueno, pues es una especie de inauguración, de no, ter, no se terminó el, lo que, el jardín como nosotros lo teníamos planeado, pero creo que nos damos una idea de lo que va a pasar, de lo que vamos a terminar y creo que es una muy buena propuesta. Ahora los quiero invitar, a vamos a inaugurar una exposición de pintura de nuestros alumnos de del Centro Cultural, del Maestro Juan Luis, que es el Maestro de Pintura y Dibujo del Centro Cultural, que lo importante de él, que, que es lo que a mí me gusta, es que él está desde que empezó el Centro Cultural, él es una persona muy comprometida con este trabajo de artes plásticas, y bueno, los quiero invitar para inaugurar, y después podemos pasar a pues, algún bocadillo que, tenemos, que tienen preparado los organizadores para toda la comunidad. Muchas gracias. So today is the opening from the train set in, in the garden. It's not finished yet, but it's a very good sample for you can have the idea of the train set. And we want to invite you also from the opening of the art exhibition from the teacher here from the Centro Cultural. And we want you to enjoy us. And after that, it's a snack here prepared for the organizers from the event. And well, you're all invited. Thank you. One more thing, one more uh, little bit of information before we turn you loose to try some of Susan's wonderful food. Um, and I've eaten enough of her food to know that I'm looking forward to this. In fact, I'm going to make you all sit here until I get over there. <laughs> but Doug Langley, do you want to? Thank you. Good afternoon. This is the Garden Railway, Railway book that David was working so passionately on and had almost completed. As you know, Susan and David had a lifelong love affair with trains and railroads. They were fortunate to witness the golden or the end of the golden era of railroading in the United States when steam was king and diesels were neat and fast. But David's love of railroading led to his becoming an amateur railroad historian and model railroad hobbyist, as you have heard earlier. In his collection, he has over 900 railway books, magazines from 36, 1936. His railroad collection includes 130 locomotives and over a thousand railroad cars. It's impressive. He really was uh, a world leader in the hobby. He was working on a book, a book on railroading in Mexico. His unfinished book contains a thumbnail sketch of the railway that connected Chapala here with Guadalajara. It was a short line in several respects. It was only 15 miles long, and it lasted, unfortunately, only for six short years. I'm honored to have been asked by Susan to finish and publish David's book. It's a book that contains 350 railroad pictures, some historic, some very old and faded ones, 180 pages, hardcover color, the proceeds from the sale of the book will go to maintain this beautiful railroad which is being built here in the garden. We're fortunate that David wrote this amazing book, a book which I think will appeal to all ages, and proceeds from its sale, as I said, will go to the Shriners to maintain the railway. We're very lucky that David devoted so much of his effort and time in the last year of his life to writing this wonderful, unique story. And I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you. And now, please do plan to spend a little time here enjoying the photographs, the amazing work that David did on the, the trains and on the buildings. 
enjoy some of the refreshments that Susan has prepared for us and that the uh, ministry here has also contributed to. And enjoy especially a time of sharing together more of your memories of David. God bless you all. Rise and shine.